Good afternoon. I was already introduced, but um, my name is Catherine, and uh, I work at the same practice where Admir is working, uh, Ziekenhuis Oost Limburg in Genk, uh, private hospital, and we mainly focus on a daily basis on orthopedic surgery. Um, I've been very lucky to be able to uh, be part of uh, quite some studies right now that we're conducting, uh, conducting at our center uh, with liposome bepivacaine, and I got the lecture with the title, Is This the Future? So um, just before I continue, I just want to say that I received uh, some research grants from Pasir Pharmaceuticals um, in, in that same um, topic on, on lipo for, for those studies that we're conducting with liposome bepivacaine. The goals uh, of this lecture will be to go over the current clinical use of liposome bepivacaine, um, the mechanisms of action, systemic and neurotoxicity concerns, local tissue and neurotoxicity, and some current research that I would like to highlight. Um, we'll have a little sneak preview on the future. So liposomal bupivacaine is a formulation that incorporates bupivacaine into small liposomes. And as these liposomes degrade, the active substance, which is bupivacaine, is released over a period of about 72 hours or more. And some people like to sometimes compare it with the structure of a pomegranate, where you have little small chambers that contain this uh, um, active substance, which is just normal bupivacaine. So what about the current clinical use? Liposomal bupivacaine um, in the USA is approved for soft tissue infiltration. And as of now, it's only available in the United States. Um, the FDA approved liposome bepivacaine based on research on uh, infiltration for hemorrhoidectomy. And basically, the drug is injected perianally to block the small uh, branches of the pedendal nerve. But if you think about it, its application in a, in a tab block is similar as the injection is made into tissue layers where small nerve branches are located. And therefore, the drug can also be used for tissue infiltration and facial blocks, such as tab blocks, peg blocks, eye packs. Here you can see uh, a good example of where the drug fills the void in treatment options. To the left is a patient who had a large debridement of the buttocks. To the right is a picture of a patient that is having wide pylonidal kist excision. And in both indications, there are no practical solutions uh, or, or peripheral nerve blocks that would uh, provide analgesia, whereas infiltration uh, has a good place here. With the existing local anesthetics, however, that analgesia that is provided is limited in time. But with liposome bepivacaine, in both cases, this was used for those two patients, and it resulted in an opioid-free analgesia for three days. So what are the data available? This is an article by Dasta and colleagues, and they summarized the available data on the efficacy of liposome bepivacaine for soft tissue infiltration compared with normal bupivacaine or bupivacaine hydrochloride in a post-surgical setting. And as you could see, the use of liposome bupivacaine reduced the cumulative pain scores as compared to bupivacaine hydrochloride. In this slide, you can see that there was a reduction of pain throughout 72 hours, and it was associated with a decreased opiate consumption. And then, of course, logically, and perhaps most importantly, this transferred into a reduction of opioid release side effects, or opioid-related side effects, so, such as pruritus, uh, respiratory depression, vomiting, and urinary retention. And this also up to 72 hours. In this picture, you can see a pericapsular infiltration with liposome bupivacaine uh, for total knee arthroplasty. And this is one of the most common uses for the drug in the United States by surgeons. So in fact, one of the studies reported that periarticular liposome bepivacaine injection was equipotent as an analgesic to intrathecal morphine 
after total knee arthroplasty. In this image, uh, you can see an example. It's actually one of our own shoulder surgeons who became a patient after rupturing his hamstrings. Um, he underwent uh, an extensive repair of these ruptured hamstrings, and we infiltrated, or the surgeon at least, uh, who operated on him, infiltrated the surgical area with liposome bipivacaine, and this resulted at three days of opioid-free analgesia. He was extremely comfortable, only had to take some paracetamol, maybe some NSAIDs, and did not require any opioids whatsoever for three days. He did give permission for sharing this information, just in case you would wonder. Importantly, liposome bipivacaine can be diluted to a much larger volumes to cover the required surgical area. And this is because one milliliter of liposome bipivacaine suspension contains about 75 million liposomes that carry the active substance. So volume expansion of liposome bipivacaine to a total volume of about 300 milliliters or less does not appear to impact its clinical efficacy or pharmacokinetic profile. Let's look at this video. So um, this video actually explains the mechanisms um, of action of liposome bipivacaine. Local anesthetics are typically administered through a small needle in several tissue layers. And the idea is that the injection of local anesthetic will anesthetize the small nerve branches and the small nerve endings the diligence with which this is administered will translate into the efficacy of, uh, of the local anesthetic infiltration. However, with liposomal bipivacaine, when that is injected into the tissues or infiltrated, um, you can see that the needle is entering the subcutaneous tissue and this smoky substance represents the free bipivacaine. Once these small amounts of free bipivacaine that are contained in every single vial of liposomal bipivacaine, it's about 3% of free bipivacaine, once um, this is absorbed, then the liposome bipivacaine remains in the injected tissue over a period of hours and days. One of the most common concerns uh, with this introduction of liposomal bipivacaine um, is local anesthetic uh, systemic toxicity. What happens if by accident liposomal bipivacaine enters the, the circulation? Fortunately, the liposome formulation of liposomal bipivacaine is actually safer than bipivacaine hydrochloride. Let's look at a summary of the available data that are published in the Clinical Drug Investigation Journal in 2013. You can see that injection of as much as three times higher dose of bipivacaine, so Expirel in a vial is a two, 266 milligrams, and they compared it to bipivacaine 100 milligrams. Uh, this was just in a soft tissue injection. This resulted in plasma levels that were substantially lower, about six, uh, no, 300. So lower than what is required for systemic toxicity. You need about 2,500 to 4,000 nanograms per ml to obtain um, central nervous system toxicity. The C max after the injection, so for one vial of 20 ml, 266 was 300. Um, after even injection of the full dose, the plasma levels were 10 times lower than the plasma level that is required to obtain central nervous system toxicity. On the left-hand side, you can see an example of the data of plasma levels after femoral nerve block. And similarly, these plasma levels start peaking only after 24 hours, but the Cmax is still four times lower, about 600 nanograms per ml, than the central nervous system toxicity levels which are 2,500 up to 4,000 nanograms per ml. Um, so therefore, you can actually say that the safety and the side effect profile of liposome bipivacaine is actually better than that of bipivacaine hydrochloride. What about neurotoxicity? 
there have been several publications that address this topic of neurotoxicity and clearly the higher the concentration and the longer the exposure of the nerves to a local anesthetic, the higher the risk of neurotoxicity. So by that logic, um, the suspension of 0.33% of liposomal bupivacaine with a duration of 72 hours presents a concern. However, all available studies on this topic failed to find any evidence of neurotoxicity so far. And as an example, this is an elaborate study in experimental animals where they um, uh, applied even intraneural liposomal bupivacaine into the sciatic nerve of pigs, but they could not find any neurotoxic effect as long as the injections were made extrafascicularly. So, no evidence for neurotoxicity. How about liposomal bupivacaine in nerve blocks? So, so far we were actually mainly focusing on infiltration, soft tissue infiltration. It's important to know that liposomal bupivacaine is not approved by the FDA for uh, nerve block applications. However, I will share the available data on this topic that we have now, and I should also mention that much of this work has been done in our institution. So, what does the literature say? Here is one publication by thoracic surgeons who used an endoscopic approach to inject liposomal bupivacaine in the intercostal nerves. And they concluded that, um, sorry, they concluded that when you inject posterior intercostal uh, nerve blocks with, lip when you inject posterior intercostal nerve blocks with liposomal bupivacaine, this will provide an effective analgesia for patients that are undergoing thoracic surgery, and it may be considered as a suitable alternative for thoracic epidurals. This is a publication by our group with pooled results from a multi-institutional uh, trial on liposome bupivacaine femoral nerve block for post-surgical analgesia after total knee arthroplasty. Here you can see the pain at rest was lower in patients who received liposomal bupivacaine as opposed to placebo, up to 72 hours. Now, when we look at the um, pain with activity, you can see that this was lower in patients, again, who received liposomal bupivacaine. And for example, here in figure number six, the proportion of subjects who reported to be pain-free was significantly larger in patients who received liposomal bupivacaine, up to 72 hours. Importantly, the use of liposomal bupivacaine in femoral nerve block in this study did not impede the ability to walk, which is important. So, to conclude, um, this article actually tells us that the femoral nerve block with liposomal bupivacaine after total knee arthroplasty resulted in modestly reduced average pain and opiate use for the first 72 hours after surgery compared with placebo. And this was not in a multimodal setting or a multimodal analgesia setting. What's the mechanism of drug delivery of liposomal bupivacaine for femoral nerve blocks? Femoral nerve block is actually accomplished by injection of the local anesthetic underneath the fascia iliaca. And the drug will then spread to reach the fascicles of the femoral nerve. But the duration of action obviously is limited as the drug will be absorbed. So when we inject liposomal bupivacaine, the injected liposomes will continue to be released with small amounts of bupivacaine up to 72 hours or longer, and this will result in a mild sensory blockade that confers prolonged analgesia. So this is the most recent publication from our practice where we added liposomal bupivacaine to bupivacaine hydrochloride to accomplish an interscalene brachial plexus block, a single shot block, for major shoulder surgery, rotator cuff repair, and total shoulder arthroplasty. 
and we wanted to see whether this would prolong the analgesic benefit. Um, as you can see, the addition of liposomal bupivacaine to bupivacaine resulted in significantly lower pain scores, up to seven days postoperatively in patients having major shoulder surgery. So liposomal bupivacaine added to standard bupivacaine hydrochloride may lower pain and enhance patient satisfaction in the first postoperative week, even in a setting of multimodal analgesia for major shoulder surgery. That was the conclusion. And so all patients received, obviously, for, um, they received first the block, they went under GA, and then postoperatively, they all received a combination of acetaminophen, NSAIDs, and then dexamethasone. Um, and the rescue medication was a tramadol a sublingual fast release. What about um, current research? Currently, there's a lot of research going on on the use of liposomal bupivacaine in small nerves, and we are close to complete four major trials uh, in our center on the use of liposomal bupivacaine. One is on uh, total shoulder replacement, uh, interscaling blocks. The other one is femoral single shot for total knee arthroplasty. Uh, then we're doing another one uh, for uh, Dupuy trend contracture, contracture, so wrist blocks, and we're doing one on uh, ankle blocks for hallux valgus repair. So in summary, the introduction of liposomal bupivacaine could possibly mean a major uh, revolution in acute pain uh, therapy. But then if you would ask, will the catheters be replaced? I don't think so. They still ha will have their uh, indications and their place. Maybe we can assume that liposomal bupivacaine could best be considered as an additive to local anesthetics. But obviously, we need more randomized controlled trials. There we, we need to do dose-ranging studies, and we need to figure out what the best sites of injections are. So the future is very exciting, and there's lots of more work to do. And we hope that soon uh, this um, liposomal bupivacaine will be approved for nerve block indications, and we'll have easier access, of course, to conduct all the trials that are still waiting. Thank you so much. anyone got any questions for Dr. Van de Pitte? It's a very exciting area. I've got a few, if no one's. No questions? Can I ask a... Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, I just wanted to ask, are there any... Um, local conditions that can affect the uh, degradation of the liposomes, like pH changes or uh, anything like that? Has anybody looked at that? I think there's, there's, there's a lot of research to be done on that topic for sure. So that's a very good question. Uh, for now, what is very important uh, when we talk about um, mixing local anesthetics, for example, um, this can only be uh, diluted with saline, and if you want to add another local anesthetic to this, it has to be bupivacaine. Because if you, for example, would use um, lidocaine or uh, ropivacaine, there would be um, a competition. They would be competing for those uh, places in these liposomes, and, and then the bupivacaine would all be faster released or be re quicker, qu quicker released. So they do not recommend at all to use it with other... Um, local anesthetics. Concerning the pH, uh, what, what clinical example do you have in mind? Um, well, we know that in, in uh, infection, uh, for example, yeah. um, then local anesthetics tend to be in, ineffective, but that, that's probably not going to affect them because it's still going to, the actual bupivacaine molecules are going to have the same physical chemical properties. Yeah. But it was just a thought. Um, I have not studied that matter, so I would not be really very sure, but it's probably similar to, to other local anesthetics. Can I, I ask one more thing, please? I, I was just what, what are the physicochemical properties of the liposomes that keep them local? Uh, is it just a size thing? Uh, because um, what stops them from leaving the area in the same way that the, um, you know, when you inject them, why don't they disappear elsewhere? Is it because they're big molecules that are held 
there or I think it This is a very interesting area, actually, we, where we have a unique uh, expertise. This is an area of research that we have done a lot at, for the last six, seven years, starting from New York and now transferred a lot of that, actually, commercial, commercial research to Belgium. Uh, it, indeed, liposomes, are, it, so it is a suspension. So if you inject liposome but pipicane into the tissue, it does not disperse just the same like a local anesthetic pipicane, uh, which is a lot more liquid uh, suspension. In fact, uh, you cannot inject liposome but pipicane through needles smaller than 25 gauge. So it becomes a lot more difficult. So it is a suspension. That works for its benefit and against it. For instance, if you want to use a large dispersion block like a PEG blocks and things, you really need to use more than one injection in order to get into the places where you want it to do. On the other hand, it works for its advantage because if you inject it in a certain well-defined well tissue space, then basically the suspension stays there and works longer. So, so those, are, those are the things that we do now. Is there a question for Amit's got one in the front row? Thank you very much. As um, somebody who doesn't regularly use continuous catheter techniques, I was really excited for the prospect of using <sighs> liposomal bupivacaine <clears throat> to kind of to replace the need for catheters. So the question, the first question is really, because of your paper that you've recently uh, published in Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine for the use of liposomal bupivacaine for interscalenes, will you change your practice and will you stop using catheters <clears throat> on the basis of that paper? I think it's very important to begin with when you use interscaling blocks in, for whatever indication to, to uh, select your patients. And not all patients would benefit because of comorbidity, for example, respiratory insufficiency. On the other hand, pumping them up with opioids is not ideal either. And for those patients, in our practice, what we usually do is we do not do a single shot into scaling, but we would place a catheter and use a very short acting local anesthetic. And then we'll see postoperatively if the patient does well and he supports the hemidiaphragmatic paralysis, which you most of the time have anyway, we can still use a catheter and continue using it. This would probably not work as an example for liposomal bupivacaine because then your block is much longer. On the other hand, the motor effect that you get with liposomal bupivacaine is probably less than, than with a, a dose of 0.5 ropivacaine, 0.5 bupivacaine. But again, these are all things that we still need to figure out, dose ranging studies, but I don't think that catheters will disappear. I don't think so. On the other hand, for patients that, for example, go home the same day uh, that now would get an interscaling single shot, they would benefit, I think, greatly from a liposomal bupivacaine single shot because it would extend the analgesia, you know, and you don't have the hassles of dealing with the catheter. Yeah, two, two quick additions to, to, to the answer. There were two clinical trials. The one that Catherine published on 50 patients, none of these people actually had any respiratory distress. There's another trial which uh, in, it's, it's, a, it's a phase three trial that includes about 180 patients having uh, a major shoulder surgery, which is currently in progress, about 140 patients enrolled. There was not a one single serious adverse reaction to re related to the uh, lung function uh, with the, with the liposome pipivacaine. And, and when it comes to whether the drug will replace catheter, just to, uh, I think Catherine has addressed that, but I would just say is, the drug as such uh, would be accessible to many more clinicians with less experience than what it takes to place a catheter. Uh, and, and therefore, I believe that, that the drug, if indeed, if it were approved, would actually take up quite a bit of that market and replace quite a few catheters, except for specific conditions where the use of a catheter is mandatory to make sure that you have an on and off switch. Catherine, the, um, uh, with single shot brachial plexus blocks, uh, Ricky Brule recently uh, mentioned that we, you know, why should we even bother? And the, and the concept or the name of rebound pain came up quite a bit. Uh, do you think that there is something like rebound pain or do you think it's just mismanaged multi... But what multi is the definition of rebound pain? Exactly. Well, uh, this is why I'm, this is, I just want to, uh, in my mind, uh, um, let's
let the concept of rebound pain not even start. I think it's just a mismanagement of pain. But I think so too. I mean, you would treat your, treat your patients who would not get an interscaling block the same way post-operatively of those who get an interscaling block. You foresee rescue medication and you, 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 you foresee multimodal uh, regimen to make sure that when the block does wear off, they have already something on board. But I think in the literature, that this, this uh, um, concept of rebound pain is making an appearance, and I think that's something which yeah. we should stop. Yes, uh, I, I totally agree with you. This concept came up with uh, Abdallah, who published a paper on meta-analysis where he found that the, uh, I think that the title of the paper is Would a single shot into scaling block stack up? And in that particular paper, the, his meta-analysis showed that basically people after, patients after interscaling block had more pain than if they didn't have one. That was one of the most ridiculous papers I've ever read because it included all literature uh, when multimodal analgesia was not used. So basically, you had either block or you, had, uh, or you have multimodal for patients who got general. And for that reason, it, it just, it, it, they never even set out in their methods to study the rebound pain. So I totally agree with you. I don't think it's well defined. I don't think we have that established. But in an era of multimodal pain therapy, I don't think we have an evidence that there's a rebound pain whatsoever. If you did not get a uh, nerve block, but you get uh, a uh, medication for pain, and if the medication for pain stopped working after six hours, but you didn't take another one, would that be rebound pain? So, so I, I don't really agree with, personally with that concept. Whether it exists or not, maybe it does exist, but it needs to be better studied. I can ask a quick question. I, read, I did read your paper in RAPM a, a month or so ago, but I've forgotten. I noticed in the control group uh, you added 5 mils, or a volume of 0.25% level or plain repivacaine to the, to the XBRL. Is that because, I can't remember, is there a delayed onset? Was that yeah, the, yeah so. there is a delay. When you look at the plasma levels, there is a delay, and the peak level only starts occurring after 24 hours. So that time you want to bridge with the plane with Bivacaine. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's also a, a great question. What, what surgeons have noticed when the drug was introduced, the pharma was very greedy. They promoted it as a panacea for everything. Just forget about anything, just use Exparel. And that really backfired. Because if you used to use in Bupivacaine for blocks or infiltration, and now you switch to Exparel liposome Bupivacaine, you will not be happy because everybody will have pain in the recovery room. And that's because it starts releasing the drug about 12, 16, 18 hours later. So now the current actual recommendations by the pharma, which is correct and it's based largely upon our work, is that you mix it with bupivacaine, so you have an early onset, and then you treat liposome bupivacaine as an additive that carries on later. I think one last question, we need to move on to the, the next talk. So. I was, um, one, uh, well, you just made me wonder if it's worthwhile if you have, um, if you sorted that your patient's stable with a catheter, and if, it's, if you can inject through it, is it, would it then be worthwhile, you know, these respiratory ones, would it then be worthwhile um, injecting through the catheter and then taking the catheter out? You mean injecting with uh, expert so, or liposomal bupivacaine yes. through the catheter? Yeah, you're saying you, you have some... this on-off switch, you've established you don't, you don't need it, and then would that be worthwhile then putting it, if it's injectable through the catheters, I don't know if it is. I've never done that before, but might be. It, it, it's a good question. I actually don't know if you can inject through the catheter, but thank you for asking because that's the first thing we're going to do after we come back, <laughs> to see whether you can actually inject it. So I, I don't know if it's injectable through the catheter. We'll find out. You've got your PhD, Solzy, don't you? <laughs> so, a uh, 10-second answer. Is it going to get released soon, do you think? Or by the do you think it will be approved anytime soon by the FDA? Do you know? Are you allowed to tell us? <laughs> you, you, you know, uh, the, the conf uh, I per Catherine d is not privy to, to the information that I have. I work for, as a consultant for us, uh, for, uh, um, for uh, Pasira Pharmaceuticals that I've been at the Department of Justice and FDA and, and all the work I have been involved. So I cannot really share much. But I can tell you that uh, uh, the, the pharma is very close to completing four trials. 
These are major trials that FDA has asked for when they rejected them for the first time around last year. And FDA was primarily concerned not with the efficacy this time around, but mostly with the uh, sa patient safety. Mind, this is the first pharma pharmacological development in local anesthetics after 25 years of dormancy. So most folks who worked for FDA on local anesthetics actually don't have expertise at this point in time. So it's all new. Uh, so safety is a big deal. As far as I know, there's been no safety concerns, and that leads me to, to be optimistic about its release. And, and, if, and if it does occur, probably sometime early next year. But I do know that pharma is, is actually actively pursuing its approval in Europe as well, at least in a country that would tolerate uh, the, the, the rather high price for the product.